I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our guest today is Chuck Close, one of the leading figures in a school of art that has come to be known as photorealism. Mr. Close, who was born in Seattle, Washington, rejected the open road of modern abstract painting and chose instead the path of human imagery. So precise that at first glance, you might think you were looking at a photograph. Chuck Close, how would you describe photorealism? What is it and what is it trying to do? I suppose it's come to mean anything that uh, has a reasonable amount of likeness uh, to a uh, photographic source and uh, uh, encompasses a lot of very disparate kinds of people. People on the West Coast, uh, for instance, who I think have a completely different kind of sensibility uh, than um, I do and maybe uh, Estes and other people who, who work in the East Coast. But uh, um, so, so there are people interested in sort of banal American image like um, um, hamburger stands and pickup trucks and uh, and um, things and uh, I think that uh, what I'm doing just by nature of the subject matter probably differs from that some but uh, the 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 word realist gives me problems too because in a way I'm not really trying to make something uh, real can't make a nose can't make you know no matter if I went to the studio and I said I want to make a nose today that all of the, the willing of that to happen isn't going to make uh, any difference. Um, the only way that I can accomplish what I want to is to understand not the reality of what it is I'm dealing with, but the artificiality of what it is. So perhaps I would feel more comfortable with new artificialists than new realists, but I am not making a nose. I'm distributing uh, pigment on a flat surface, and the distribution of those um, marks, uh, if, if there's some consistent attitude towards what those marks mean and some notion of syntax uh, that, um, uh, that a particular kind of marking system uh, will generate a certain kind of uh, image, then um, uh, it's that kind of concern with, with the artificiality that really interests me. Now, I'm not denying the fact that there's a big head there when I'm all done, and that there are many ways to, uh, to approach it. And I want the viewer to approach it uh, any way he or she uh, wishes to. But for my purposes, you can't, uh, my paintings take a year or more, some of them a year or more. You can't sit there thinking about making something real, making something um, that has something to do with life experience or trying to make a head or a nose. You just can't physically do it. Let's begin at the beginning. You started with big, loose, open, abstract paintings with lots and lots of paint. And now it's been said that you get the best pictorial mileage ever, something like 63 square foot. Most of Mr. Close's painting or seven, paintings are seven by nine feet. 63 square feet out of an eight by 10 photo and about two tablespoons of black acrylic paint. How did you go from big, loose, open abstractions to what I have just too simply described? Well, my, my tax man is uh, trying to figure out how I can only take 60 cents a year off for paint. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it is a, a little bizarre, I suppose. But um, to, uh, to back up and explain how it happened, um, I think sometimes um, the, the way movement takes place in an artist's career, and I won't use the word progress because that implies moving up, but just movement um, is, um, uh, is a sort of mystifying process for, for people. But um, if I can explain what happened to me, I, got, I, was, a, I, was, I was a super student. Um, I was exactly what they had in mind. I could as a colorist. Kind, I could make any kind of art marks you wanted. And I made them. Uh, Where did this take place? Day. Well, uh, on the West Coast, University of Washington, and then I went to graduate school uh, at Yale and um, studied in Europe for a while. But I, you know, I was. Uh, I got rewarded. I got scholarships. I was very good. I was told I had a good sense of color. I was told I had good hands. Um, what that meant was that uh, I knew that certain colors. Certain color combinations uh, 
were interesting. I knew what art looked like. Once you know what art looks like, it's not hard to make some of it. Um, but if you go, but if you're going to make something that looks like art, it by nature must look like someone else's art, or it wouldn't look like art. And uh, the dilemma that I found myself in after having gotten out of graduate school is. Uh, uh, enjoying making art, but not liking what I made, not liking the product. And uh, I found myself in, in, in real trouble, not knowing what the hell I wanted to do. And so, for lack of any heavy art idea, um, the, really, there was no profundity at all. I was really just desperate. Uh, so, uh, since I didn't have anything, any art ideas, anything I wanted to do, I simply tried to make sure that I couldn't keep making the same old paintings I had been making. So I wanted a very specific image so that um, it would be as different as possible, plus that no matter how beautiful a shape, if it weren't the shape in the photograph, it was wrong. I craved, after winging it on my good taste and guts for so many years, I wanted rights and wrongs desperately, anything. Any, I was totally capricious and arbitrary, which system that I, I, I chose to use, but I desperately wanted something that was right or wrong. So the photograph gave me shapes. Now the interesting thing is that when I, w when I had every shape in the world open to me, I had no limitations, I made the same seven dumb shapes over and over. Um, the minute I uh, decided to accept the uh, limitation I, uh, of, um, of, of the shapes that occurred in the photograph, I found myself making shapes that I'd never seen before, I'd never made before, so I found that liberating. Um, secondly, I had always been, uh, always tried to pull off paintings with my good <coughs> sense of color, uh, which was uh, crap. Um, uh, at any rate, uh, I decided if I depended so heavily on color, I would get color out of there completely and I'd make black and white paintings. Thirdly, I, I could never make a decision and uh, I would paint in and paint out and change and scrape it all off the floor and put it all back on and you know, and uh, I, I wanted to, I wanted to have every mark that I put on the canvas still be there and still be cr contributing to the image by the time I was through. The only way to, to do that was to work as thinly as possible and, and to not allow to paint, uh, to paint in and out. So to the, I got involved with this notion of the least amount necessary to do something. The least amount of paint necessary, excuse me, to make a black and white painting is black on a white canvas. So um, I worked with this very thin medium of just black, almost black water. And it turns out that it only takes about a tablespoon of paint to make a painting. It wasn't something that I imposed. I'm only going to make a painting with one tablespoon. And if I got one foot to the bottom and ran out of paint, I would quit or something. It's, uh, uh, What's the medium that you use, and what are your tools? And how did you arrive at a seven by nine foot canvas? OK. Well, the medium is uh, it's either acrylic or watercolor or whatever variety of things. Uh, I also, one of the other limitations that I uh, chose was I, I had tools that were old friends. A brush that had pulled off a painting five paintings ago that was like, it was now endowed with some incredible divine mystic power. And, Your lucky uh, brush. In a clutch situation, <laughs> I would grab that brush. And, uh, uh, so I said, uh, well, all my ha I was trying to break habits. Uh, and so all my habits were connected with the tools. So I had to throw the tools out. I got new tools. I got an airbrush. Uh, other tools which I had, I felt I had no finesse uh, with a no degree of facility. Um, so, uh, and uh, oh, how, how can this seven by nine feet? Uh, that's as high as my ceiling was. Um, had my ceiling been higher, they probably would have been bigger. Um, the, it's a ratio of... But nobody of, else's ceiling would have been higher. Wasn't that a practical consideration? Uh, well, I've never been terribly practical. I always build the boat in the basement and have to figure out how to get it out. Uh, <laughs> Um, it's a ratio of a 4 by 5 photograph or an 8 by 10 photograph. 7 by 9 is essentially the same proportion. And so uh, I had a notion about how the head would fit in. Also, and to be quite honest, and I don't mean it flippantly at all, the bigger they are, the longer they take to walk by. And uh, uh, I'll, I make no bones about it. I want, I want a high impact kind of image, and I want to knock them dead when they walk. I want to suck them in. Um, yeah, I want something that can be seen from 100 yards and, uh, and then uh, hopefully orchestrate an experience for them so that 
not only does it have that kind of impact on distance, but if they get up close enough, it all dissolves into, um, into uh, uh, a kind of orchestrated visual experience independent from the image uh, marks on, on a surface of a canvas. Perhaps uh, we should talk for a moment first about black and white. There was a period for, I guess, about three or four years that it really was several tablespoons full of black acrylic paint that you used. How did you achieve shading? I didn't, I didn't want to make decisions out, out of context. So I did away with the palette and I just kept, um, I, I wanted everything to happen on the canvas, I wanted all the paint to mix on the canvas. And the black and white paintings, to get the modeling or the shading or whatever you want to call it, was just a question of applying more and more pigment. And it staggered, the more dense it got, the darker it got. Um, but you have to, um, since I didn't use any white paint, I had to paint the whites by not painting them, by going around them. Just, an, again, a kind of economy. Like, it may take longer to make a painting, but in another way, it's economical in that it's the least amount of pigment necessary to build an image. Let's talk um, about how you do choose a subject for your portraits. They are not only identifiable, they are people very close to you. That's a very precarious thing to do. How do you go about choosing a subject? Well, I, I decided a long time ago that, um, that I wasn't going to um, do any commissioned portraits because I, I assumed that anybody with an ego large enough that they want to have a seven by nine foot high painting <laughs> of themselves hanging around the house probably would want the nose straightened and the teeth capped and a lot of crap that I wouldn't want to get into. So I, had, I was uh, stuck with the dilemma of who to get, um, who to rob images from, in a sense. Um, and, and I didn't want to go to a totally anonymous people. I, didn't, I also didn't want the paintings to be identify the famous person, you know, paintings of Richard Nixon or somebody. I wanted the people to be <laughs> relatively anonymous but it's very specific. Um, I uh, feel very fortunate that my friends have allowed, have loaned me their image, which is uh, what I think the, uh, uh, I mean that in a sort of specific way. It's a very difficult thing to deal with a nine foot high image of yourself as I, I painted myself several times. Anything that's wrong with your face, like if your nose is bent a quarter of an inch, when it's nine feet high, it's now bent four inches. <laughs> and you can't kid yourself anymore. You can't say, my nose isn't bent. It's a, there it is. Um, so How do your subjects a, react to this? Are they still uh, your friends? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, they've been very good about it. But they almost always immediately change the way they look. Um, <laughs> It's, no, it seems to be an, an unconscious. Be specific. Give us an example. Well, what do you mean? People with long hair cut it short. People with short hair grow it long. People with mustaches shave them off. People with, uh, you know. Uh, well, only one person ever understood what I was doing. I think you're referring to the Joe Zucker the Joe, portrait. Yeah, Joe Zucker. Now, Joe is an interesting guy. Joe has curly blonde hair clear out the hair. And, uh, when I photographed him, I didn't even recognize him. He had gotten a haircut, he bought a jar of Vaseline, he greased his hair down, he <laughs> borrowed a white shirt and tie, because he didn't own one, and borrowed someone else's glasses, and he looked like a Midwest used car salesman for a hundredth of a second. Um, when he, then he went home and washed his hair. And, and I made, what he realized was that all he needed to do was provide me with evidence that somebody like that existed. It need not be an image that he had to relate to or deal with. You said that someone like that existed for one one hundredth of a second. I think we should talk for a moment about who takes your photographs, what process you use to work. Do you use mechanical projections? Do you work from a photograph? Are there sittings? Well, I bring a lot of people in to photograph, and um, I don't, um, I hate Photography. I mean, I like other people's photographs, but I hate the process. I, I hate owning equipment. Um, I have the opposite of the Midas touch. Anything I touch turns to shit. <laughs> and, uh, if I own a camera, it is going to uh, jam or something's going to go wrong with it. And I al always forget to stop down you know, the right f-stop or something. And I'm, I al I'm always, I'm very nervous, so I'm always on the edge of hysteria while I'm photographing. So I found it uh, very good to have uh, a photographer there 
who owns the equipment will remind me that I forgot to close down the lens or that I didn't pull the, uh, uh, the uh, slide on the film. And, um, well, then, is that image yours or the photographer's? Uh, well, it's probably somewhere between. Uh, I don't think the photographer would take a photograph like that. Usually, they hate my photographs. Why? Well, because I'm taking a very specific photograph for... Uh, Are you cropping the photograph in the camera? Yeah. How do you do that? What do you do? What do you look for? Uh, well, the head fits in the rectangle a particular way. Uh, so it's going to come so far from the top and so far from the sides and down to here. And, and then I just start uh, trying to get the... What is your cutoff point visually? Well, usually somewhere around the, the neck. I want to get some shoulders. I want to get a few different kinds of things to paint. Let's get some shirt, you know. And uh, uh, I like people who have glasses because there's shiny stuff to paint. But uh, When did you decide to give up black and white pictures for uh, color pictures, and how did you arrive at a palette without a palette? Right. When I, uh, I worked for several years in black and white, and uh, I got to the point where I didn't, uh, there were no surprises in the studio anymore. So uh, I wanted to change something. I looked around for an, a variable to alter. The first thing that occurred to me was to change the subject matter. But since I'm making a painting of a photograph, what the photograph was of, although it would affect what the painting looked like and what the painting meant, would not change what I did in the studio particularly. In other words, if I did a, if I did a painting of a rock with black and black and white, the same size, what I would be doing in the studio would be essentially the same. And what I was bored with was not the painting or the image, but what I was doing in the studio. So I looked for a variable that I could alter that would drastically change what I did in the studio. So of all the variables going to color was going to tr change mm -hmm. things the most. Now, I wanted the same kind of economy in the color paintings that I had in the black and white. So I said, what's the least number of colors necessary to make a full color image? And I thought four was in the regular printing process, but it turns out that, that three, red, yellow, and blue. So, I wanted, so if I'm going to make a painting without a palette, all the color has to mix on the canvas which means I have to know how much red, how much yellow, and how much blue. So directly on color, the canvas. Directly on the canvas. One at a time. One at a time. Th I paint three one-color paintings on top of each other. So that first you painting. would start with a red painting. Yeah. And the entire? No, not the entire. I, would, I couldn't wait. Where do you start, by the way? I start at the top, and I work down because I'm a slob, and I splatter and kick and, and paint. And how stuff. much of the head do you take at each time, from, say, the top well, of the I head to the? chunk. Uh, you know, where there's a logical edge. Uh, so Do you top. always use the same root? No, I try not to. I mean, well, I mean, just basically from the top down. But um, So let us say you started from the top and you were up to here, you'd have a red yeah, forehead. Yeah, a red hair, say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, again, you see, it, like, like I was saying about that green that mixed out of context, but it's red, it's obvious, you can't leave it red. So you might as well put the blue on. <laughs> So then I make a blue painting on top, but now I have a purple painting. Well, you can't leave it purple. So you have to put the yellow on to make it full color. So it forces, again, it forces a kind of attenuated, elongated, <coughs> slowed down time, uh, where my natural instinct is to just slap the stuff on. Uh, the process itself forces me to think differently, have a different kind of thought process, I move at a different rate of speed, uh, images are generated much more slowly, forces another kind of introspection, perhaps. You've said that you don't like equipment, so that you don't take your own photographs, but here you end up with an 8x10 photograph that gets translated to a 7x9 portrait. Do you use mechanical projection no. for that? Well, how do you translate, how do you compensate for that difference? Well, um, I'm, uh, any mechanical process, so first of all, part of our vision for a blown up image comes from uh, posters, cheap reproductive processes, or the or theater, cinema. Uh, anything that, it's always something small that's physically blown up. So a little piece of film in a camera is blown up on the screen and it jiggles, and it's blurry, and it's moving, and it's... And but it's you want to blur in some of your well, photographs. Well, I'm trying to get another kind of blur, but not that kind of blur. Mm -hmm. So I, what I'm interested in is like a non-mechanical enlargement process. I look at something that's small, and I try and make something big that has the same issues in it that the small thing has. And uh, so it's like, uh, for me, I could, never, I could never pump it through this 
artificial enlargement process. It just wouldn't make any sense. And it's all done visually? Yeah. And you paint directly on the canvas, too? Yeah. You said you wanted another kind of blur. Was that deliberate, and what kind of blur do you have in mind? Well, a lot of things happen by accident, and you like it, and then you want to incorporate it into your work. I tried to make sharp pictures, and I, some of them came out blurry. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, there'd be a depth of field difference, so part of it would be fuzzy, bl blurry, out of focus. And so when I, I said, oh, gee, that might be interesting to make a painting from, well, different kinds of marks, some sharp marks and some blurry marks. And so then I got, when I, real, when I started making these paintings, the paintings are so large that at a relatively short viewing distance, it's hard to deal with the iconography of the head as a whole. So you're forced to scan the picture, and, and uh, I wanted to deal in a non-relational way with the imagery. Like, um, we know the space of the head because we know heads. We know that the nose sticks out in front, and the nose is in front of the cheeks, and the cheeks are in front of the ears, and the ears are whatever. So that there's a way to understand the space out of what we know to be true. But, but I wanted to arrive at a potentially abstract reading uh, of space, independent from the iconography, due to the visual clues. So I have like the nose blurry and the cheek sharp and the ears blurry again. So that as you scan, you would realize that as, these, as the little pieces of information get blurry, that you're moving back in space. And, and uh, as blurry as they are here, anything that's equally blurry must be in the same level in space. So it's a possible reading, uh, you understand what I mean? So, uh, po a potential reading other than through the, uh, the iconography. Well, there was a time when you imitated the mechanical uh, process by producing objects on a pencil grid. Mm -hmm. What did you have in mind when you did that? And what did you have in mind when you used the dot system? It was, at least for me, it was a dot and grid system. I don't know, but I must have been crazy. <laughs> uh, I thought when I got the white, can I, you know, it takes me, I put 15 coats of hand sanded gesso on a canvas. I get it all done, and I'd say if I was Bob Ryman, I'd be done already. <laughs> then I put the pencil grid on, and I said, well, if I was Agnes Martin, I'd be done already. Mm -hmm. It's like when you drive by and you see the motel, if you lived here, you'd be home by now. Yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, then I realized that I got another, you know, another 14 months of sitting there spraying these stupid dot dots, and, and I really do want what I was thinking, but essentially, what what happened was that I've I've always held to the to the notion that one of the things that I wanted was to make every square inch of the painting as important as every other square inch. But physically, uh, that was not possible. If you're making a black and white painting, those areas that are white you don't do anything to, mm -hmm. and those areas which are black you do something to. So you can't make every square inch the same uh, physically because. Uh, of the difference in activity. So it's an intellectual or attitudinal uh, uh, situation of things being as important as something else. But I, I wanted the activity of making a, um, a stroke which equals a hair is very different than spraying a piece of cheek. So again, the way, way at my hand moved, the, uh, the articulation of the marks across the surface was different for each area. So uh, I, I, I wanted to make pieces in which every square inch was physically exactly the same. So I, I, and also I wanted to get away from virtuoso art marks. This is my good hand again, how beautiful this stroke was or whatever. I wanted, I wanted a stupid, inarticulate, uninteresting, uh, mark that in and of itself could not be more interesting than the last mark or, or more beautiful than the next. And so I decided I would simply spray, I would divide a, a canvas into, um, in the case of the largest ones, 100, 160 some thousand squares, and I would spray a dot. Each dot would be hit an average of 10 times. This is sprayed so, with, an, with what? With an airbrush. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's about a million six hundred thousand dots when it comes right down to it. About 14 months of my life and my eyes went and uh, it was rubber room time. I was a mess. But anyhow, uh, uh, you are what, so critical what, what I wanted to do was, what I ended up was, here's a this, here's this system in which there is no difference in the way you make hair. It's all dots. I mean, there's no dot, dot doesn't equal hair or dot doesn't equal skin or background. 
So the, the way the image was generated was in the way these dots came together and in some notion of syntax and how these, how these marks related to each other. So that there wasn't, there was no virtuoso brushmanship or finesse at all. You've used the word syntax several times. What do you mean when you say that? Well, I mean, we, we're tagged onto a long, there is no way to do anything. We're tagged onto the long end of a series of conventions that everybody has agreed upon as uh, meaning something. I mean, perspective, is a, perspective isn't real, but perspective is a convention that we agree if these lines converge to railroad tracks going back or whatever. Um, now, in the 20th century, marks themselves have become content. Obviously, if Roy Lichtenstein can make a painting about a brush stroke, brush stroke itself is potentially content. Mm -hmm. Okay, now every time you have a mark making system or any codifying system where you assign a value, a meaning to any kind of mark, then you get involved in the, in the physicality of what you're doing plus what it stacks up to mean on another level. And that's what I mean by syntax. How do you translate that into the image that we see? An image that is obviously not neutral on the one hand, mm -hmm. but on the other, in no way reflects the sitter's, so to speak, ego. Well, um, I can't worry about the sitter's ego. Uh, in a sense, it's like, um, I would think it would be like a, a filmmaker or something. He, he's trying to deal with something that's very emotional, uh, a war or, or love or something. And what he's doing is counting the frames per second and whether or not to dissolve here, you know, or something. I mean, the, 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 the physicality of his involvement is everything. Uh, if, and if he does that well, eventually he will build an image which is believable, which make people cry or whatever. But you can't make that, you can't just say, I want to make people cry and just turn the camera loose and hope that you ever come up with a film that's going to do that. Uh, so I, I care a great deal about the people, and I want people to relate to those images as images of people, also as photographs and paintings from photographs and paint and, you know, all these other things. Uh, but you can't afford to uh, wallow in the, uh, the humanity of it or, the, uh, or, or what you know to be, I, don't, I feel you can't, uh, uh, you know, I certainly you can't, even if you can for a but while, you can't that sounds like another it. defense you against your own humanity. You can't maintain it for a year. So what do you do with the human quality? Well, I try and get it in the photograph to the first, in the first place. And I try and maintain a, a consistent attitude towards what I'm doing so that in the translation, whatever aspect of that is in the photograph ultimately ends up in the final product. Um, but I don't think you ever get it by by simply desiring it, <laughs> if they if to sit down and do it. What is it, what are you telling us in your visual imagery about uh, the human condition, or are you? Well, I'm trying not. Uh, I think I am, but I'm trying not to editorialize it. I'm trying not to crank it up for any given effect, or to make sure that it's seen one way. What I'm trying to do is put it out there in relatively objective terms, trying not to editorialize footnote or otherwise uh, uh, point, put arrows pointing to things, mm -hmm. and uh, deal with it pretty much uh, the way I, uh, as directly as possible. Thank you very much, Chuck Close. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and this is Inside New York's Art World.